Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Alona Argerian, and welcome to an introduction to advocacy um, led by MDPHA in partnership with Healthcare for All Maryland. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Dr. Alona Argerian. I'm joined today um, with uh, my co chair, Towson, as well as um, Stephanie from Maryland um, Healthcare for um, Healthcare for All. And um, I'll let everybody introduce my, themselves. Um, so this is me. I'm an epidemiologist. Um, I was trained at the University of Michigan. I'm currently an assistant professor at Georgetown University School of Health, as well as um, a professor in the epidemiology graduate program. Um, I've previously worked at the National Cancer Institute in the Division of Cancer Epidemiology and Genetics and um, still hold a position there. Um, today, I'm an at-large board member of the Maryland Public Health Association. This is my third year on the board. And uh, this is my second year co-chairing the um, advocacy committee, and I will continue to do so in the upcoming uh, legislative year. You can see my email on the bottom right um, hand corner of the slide in case you'd ever like to contact me directly. I'll turn it over to Tosin. All right. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Dr. Olua Tosin Olateju. I go by Tosin. I am currently teaching as an assistant professor at Ellen Fold School of Nursing, Captain State University. Um, I also teach at Morgan State University School of Community Health and Policy in their undergraduate program as an adjunct. I'm the founder and executive director of Food and Care for All. It's a nonprofit um, that promotes food security and quality health services for underserved. I currently um, got a, I recently got appointed as the commis um, commissioner and co-chair for the Maryland Public Health Commission. And um, it's a two-year term. I am also serving with the loner as the advocacy um, committee co-chair. Um, this is the second year on the run. Welcome everybody. We're so excited to have you join this training this morning and I will pass it on to Stephanie. And um, as just like you know, Ilona mentioned my email, you can see it on the bottom right there. Thank you. All right, Stephanie, off to you. Great, hi everyone. I'm Stephanie Clapper, Deputy Director at Maryland Healthcare for All Coalition. I've been there for about 10 years. Um, I teach a class on advocacy at the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, along with my colleagues, uh, Catherine and Vinny. Um, and I have, I think, been on the advocacy committee for Maryland Public Health Association for, I don't know, maybe seven years now, um, which I can't believe it's been that long. But uh, it's been a great experience, and I'm just so excited to be here with all of you today. Uh, thanks for coming. All right, so we just wanted to start by with a little introduction of what the Maryland Public Health Association or MDPHA is. We're one of the oldest and most vibrant state affiliates of the American Public Health Association um, or APHA. Um, we're the Maryland's uh, leading professional organization for those working in the field of public health. Uh, we have several hundred members and there are numerous committees that fall under MDPHA, including the student section of the Maryland Public Health Association, which I believe a lot of the individuals on the call today are part of. Um, the Advocacy Committee, which is obviously led by Tosin and myself, Finance Committee, Program Committee, Membership Committee, and Communications Committee. There are a few other smaller committees that are not mentioned on this list, and, but if you're interested in any of them, please feel free to reach out to um, Tosin or myself, and we can lead you to um, some of the representatives on some of these other committees. So advocacy is stronger through partnerships, and therefore we have a number of existing partnerships with organizations in the state of Maryland. So obviously healthcare for all is a, is a very large partnership. And thank you so much, Stephanie, for being here today and, and leading our training. We also partner with Smart on Pesticides Maryland, as well as the Maryland League um, of Con Conservation Voters, um, Healthy School Food Maryland, as well as CASA. Um, and when I say that we partner with these various organizations, I mean that we try to combine efforts to support bills, um, at least from, from an advocacy standpoint, that kind of align across these different groups. Uh, we also are able to partner with these organizations in terms of, for instance, being able to go to Annapolis to give testimony. We can partner some of the students who might not have previously had experience in um, advocacy. If let's say you wanted to go and give oral testimony, we could, if Tosin and myself are not able to be in Annapolis that day, we can partner you with somebody who works with one of these fabulous organizations, and then you can meet with them and they can kind of show you the ropes, um, which ends up being um, a wonderful experience for everybody involved. 
So just to give you a quick year in review, um, there is a link here that uh, links you to the legislative wrap up. This can also be found on our website that gives you a a uh, detailed list of all the various bills that we chose to partake in um, in this past fiscal year. Um, in total, we weighed in on 25 different bills that covered a variety of different topics. And I have selected a few highlights that you can see on your screen right now that have passed. So this is, includes the Commission on Public Health Establishment, um, shout out to Tosin, um, Maryland Medical Assistance Programs for the American Children's um, Health Program. We worked on health benefits exchange. We worked on cannabis reform. We worked on um, environmental health policy. So things like natural resources and green space equity program establishment, alcoholic beverage licensing, pesticides um, and PFAS testing. Um, we also looked at the Maryland Health Benefits Exchange um, as um, for the Sunrise Extension. So what can we look forward to in 2024? We have a number of different legislative priorities. Um, these are kind of just generalized topics that, are, that the various bills can fall into that we believe um, are really important. So those include environmental health, smoking, alcohol, and cannabis, health equity, which includes prescription affordability, which should be a very big year for that, uh, mental health, violence prevention, maternal and fetal health, as well as nutrition, food access, and safety. Um, this does not prohibit us from supporting other bills that might come to light um, that don't very neatly fall into one of these categories, but we, I think, intentionally try to make these broader in a general sense so that we can um, encompass a lot of different public health um, policies within these different buckets. That said, how can you get involved? So obviously today you're you're here to attend the advocacy training, and I'm hoping that means that a lot of you want to get involved in advocacy work. I, you know, teaching at a university, being part of various universities in the past, I think this is a very uh, amazing chance for you to be able to integrate into advocacy and see how things work. It is not part of our traditional coursework um, in any way, shape, or form. So I'm really excited to see everybody here today. Um, to give you a little bit of a rundown, this is a new framework. Uh, Tosin and I worked really hard and thought through a lot of different ways by which we can improve advocacy committee. And this is kind of what we ended up coming up with. So as your committee co-chairs, Tosin and I do have final approval and submission um, rights to any of the written testimony that is given on behalf of MDPHA. Um, that said, there are going to be legislative priority leads for all of those previous buckets that I had shown you. Um, Tosin and I will likely also partake as legislative priority leads. What that means is that we'll aid in identifying relevant bills, um, we'll give testimony assignments, and we'll review anything that comes forward. Um, underneath that are the advocates. So these are going to be largely first year um, individuals who might not have as much experience in advocacy. Um, and they are kind of like the mentees in a sense um, to try to help us um, move our, um, our legislative priorities forward and moving some of these bills um, forward. And what that means is that they'll work to, um, to learn, to draft written and oral testimony. You're also welcome to give testimony. Um, it does not prohibit you, as the asterisk says, from being able to identify relevant bills. So if you find something that you're really passionate about that you say, you know, I think MDPHA should weigh in on this particular bill, you are more than welcome to voice that. Um, we would love to hear your opinions, your thoughts, um, anything that you can kind of do, do to help us um, and help public health in general is always welcome. Um, and that was also said for the legislative priority leads, those individuals can also similarly uh, partake in being able to, to not only identify bills, but also write written testimony. Um, and I think Stephanie will likely touch on this in greater uh, detail, but just what does it mean to write, you know, written testimony? What does it mean to give written test, to give testimony? Um, essentially what it is, is you're, you're trying to break down a lot of the, um, science that may that may support or oppose a certain bill that's being suggested and so your job would be then to to be like that translating arm for the legislators um, who can then uh, be able to integrate that into their decision making um so with that i'll end my little section and i'll turn the podium over uh to stephanie um if there's any questions feel free to pipe in now or you can pipe in um towards the uh, end of the session. Uh, we're happy to hear any any thoughts or feedback um, throughout. This is kind of a 
casual training event. So um, feel free to to speak up. And Ilona, may I just add a few um, things oh, based on the oh, new, okay. recent developments from the grants that we got um, that would, you know, 100% tying into um, a lot of these efforts. Um, and as Ilona, I'm sorry, as Ilona presented, you can see the, the breakdown of how students can get involved. But I just wanted to say that we recently received an um, advocacy, um, a, a, an affiliate advocacy grant. And what this grant would do would um, encourage students to participate, students across different schools um, that are members of APHA, because that's where it starts from, and then members of the advocacy committee. But um, it would in incentivize a lot of the efforts that the students would get involved in. And I just wanted to um, touch on some of those um, incentives. One is transportation costs, okay? Like let's say a student ends up going to Annapolis or any of the places. Sometimes we, um, we could be required to testify at a local level. I also wanted to mention, because we have received um, requests as such. Um, so everything is not always in Annapolis. So, um, but it will cover. Um, it could cover the transportation costs. So it would. It would. Um, you could just send us the mileage, and we can, um, you know, pay for that. Um, bi weekly meetings are um are going to be held during the legislative year. But these are free. This would you won't be paid for attending the the meetings, um, because that's part of the membership for advocacy. Um, social advocacy training, this would also cover that we'll have a big, just to know what you expect, we're going to have a big summer social event um, coming up. We have to decide on the date, but hopefully we'll have food, drinks, and then more trainings. Um, so much trainings to come, you know, on that. Um, but that's one, one big event. Um, additionally, this would cover um, stipends when we have consultants come on board. Um, we can give them stipends. And then the fun part is students can receive up to $25 um, each per testimony. So if, um, and then of course, when we say, it has to be, as Ilona mentioned, would approve it. But then if you're involved in the writing of it, drafting of it, um, you do get that stipend, $25. So it's it's just a nice incentive. Um, but again, know that you're not alone in this process. We don't expect you to, you know, to you know be on this journey alone. We would provide the support, but this is just another way to um you know encourage students to get involved. Okay. Um did I miss any other um stipend? Ilana? You had a question in the chat. Uh it oh, looks like somebody said, Thank you for the information on the grant. Is it being funded by APHA? Yes, it is being funded by APHA. Yes. Okay. All right. Perfect. And then I um I also wanted to just mention that we have, in addition to students from our different um affiliate groups, we have interns. One of our interns is Gladys, whom you would meet um as time goes on. So in addition to having our support, having support of um our partners like Stephanie, um, you also have the support of Gladys. Um, um and you get to meet her on um subsequent calls. Okay. And welcome, Sandra. All right. If there are no other questions, I just wanted to just point that out and um, we're excited. Thank you. And Stephanie, on to you. Oh, well, thank you, Alona um, and Tosin. I'm really excited to be here today. Uh, and I think we have an intimate enough group here, a small enough group where we could probably go around and do a quick round of introductions. Um, I'd love to hear, you know, um, where your your background? Are you a student? Are you a professor? Are you an advocate um, from some other back background? Um, some a public health issue you're interested in, and also something you'd like to learn here today. So, um, would someone like to volunteer to go first, or I can just call out people as I see your names here. I can go first. Oh. Great. Hi. My name is Chidube Eboluche, and I'm a doctorate or doctor of public health student at Morgan State University. And um, in Morgan State, I work with Morgan KS, a center that is into community-based participatory research. And we are working on a tobacco cessation program among the youths. And um, I'm here to learn how to be a good advocate because I want to equip myself with that skill. Yeah. Thank you.
Thank you, Chita. I'm happy to go next if you want. Jump right in, Andrea. <laughs> Andrea Kalfaglu, I am an associate professor of public health at UMBC. Um, in the spring, I'm really excited that I'm going to um, get to teach my advocacy class again. So uh, it's called uh, Health Justice and Advocacy. Last year, I, I focused the class on um, mental health, and um, I'm also I'm on the board of NAMI, Howard County, the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill or for Mental Illness. I think they've changed the name. Um, so I'm going to be very interested in um, possibly even being one of your legislative priority leads on um, either mental health or the other uh, issue that I'm very deeply engaged in is um, food uh, insecurity among college students and our students are actually um, looking into uh, introducing bills trying to get um, legislators to sponsor specific bills around uh, that would expand access to SNAP for college students across Maryland. Fabulous thank you so much Andrea. So good to see you. And just to um provide um a little bit um you know insight, Andrea actually joined us um, you know, joined some of our sessions last um this past legislative year. So we're very excited for the work we're gonna do in the upcoming year. Thank you. And just in case anybody's interested, the NAMI Virtual Advocacy Day is going to be February 7th, which is earlier than it was last year. And I don't know if anybody's ever participated in it. I get to actually schedule and plan it this year because um, I'm on the policy committee for NAMI. It went really, really well last year, incredibly well organized. Um, the legislators from, so they matched participants who wanted, who were advocates who wanted to share their story. They did training so it was like a three hour training on how to develop your elevator speech, your three minute um, speech to a legislator using your own story to then lead to support for a particular bill. And so I set it up in such a way where, uh, because it was virtual, my students could come in and out of the, of the classroom where the legislators and other advocates were actually on a large screen and they got to listen to me testify, but they also got to listen to other, <clears throat> excuse me, other um, advocates um, give their stories and advocate for specific um, legislation. And I'm really excited that we got the extra funds for 988, which was one of the legislative um, priorities for NAMI last year. Thank you so much, Andrea. Uh, thanks for all your advocacy um, and, and for your contributions to advocacy committee. Uh, and I see in the chat, there's a message from Valerie who can't uh, speak right now, but can type in the chat. I work for a nonprofit healthcare system and I'm a nurse who takes care of the well-being of nurses within our system. As someone who works in well-being, I'm always encouraging people to advocate for themselves in the healthcare space. So this webinar will be helpful in learning about true advocacy. Thanks for what you do, Valerie, and, and for joining us. And I, I hope you recover from surgery um, as easily and as quickly as possible. Uh, okay, um, who would like to go next? Can I volunteer? Your we'll go next if you oh, want. I'll, okay, Henry's volunteering. Please go ahead, Henry. Uh, I'm Henry Montes, and I've um, been working as a volunteer in the Montgomery County Health Arena uh, for a number of years, and have in the past testified on uh, some issues uh, before, actually it was before, uh, uh, I think it was the Justice Committee, but but anyway, the reason I'm on is that I wanted to see, it's been a, a long time since I've done that kind of thing, I wanted to see uh, what kinds of issues the affiliate is, is looking at and how it approaches those issues at the state level. I think at the county level, uh, it's important to know what's going on at the state level, so um I'm kind of an advocate for the Latino population here and uh 
the issues really are statewide issues in a lot of ways. So um, anyway, I just want to kind of peek in and see what you guys are doing and how you're doing it. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. So next, um, so my name is Lila and I'm an intern at Healthcare for All. Um, so I get to admire Stephanie's work <laughs> um, often. And then I'm also a social work student at the University of Maryland School of Social Work. Um, so I'm super excited to continue to grow and understanding advocacy work um, and le learn more about what is going on um, through this. So thank you for having me. All right, I can go next. Thank you for joining us. All right, so I'll go next. Oh, look at my background. Sorry about that. So many meetings. <laughs> uh, my name is Genevieve Zaro Ganga, and I um, currently serve as I'm a member of APHA and the MDPHA, uh, recently elected at large board member. I currently serve as um, the director for HIV and STI prevention at the Baltimore City Health Department. Um, in that capacity, I oversee the federal and state grants that we give to organizations in Baltimore City to ensure that um, the residents of Baltimore City have unfettered access to uh, free and confidential HIV testing. So my work also involves many things, uh, but um, it also involves working with our community stakeholder groups like the HIV planning group um, and commission uh, for Baltimore City. And um, while the commission can engage in advocacy, I technically cannot as a member, as a government official, um, but I am here to learn how to do, to do so, how to go about um, advocating. I've written um, testimony for some bills related to HIV for um, during the last um, legislative session, um, but I want to learn on a personal level how to go about um, giving like in-person testimony um, to also help uh, strengthen the work that our com com community groups are, are doing. And then another part of my work is I'm a co-founder um, of a small nonprofit called um, Shaping Health Equity, and it's a organization that's focused on the health and well-being of um, Black women, improving the health outcomes for um, Black women in, in Baltimore City. So thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. We are so pleased to have you on board today. Thank you so much. Hopefully I, we can learn, learn you know, a number of things from you. Thank you. I can, I can go next. My name is I'm Reverend Dr. Sandra Connor. I'm a, a uh, co-worker with Stephanie Clapper and also Lila at uh, Maryland Citizens Self Initiative. I'm a de deputy director person there and our work is around healthcare advocacy and I'm excited about what I've learned since I've been there about advocating for uh, equitable health needs of the citizens, for the citizens of, of Maryland. I'm also um, affiliated with the Baptist Ministers Night Conference and empowerment for collective change, trying to do whatever we can to make sure the faith community is aware of how they too can advocate. We're in the process now forming what we're calling social justice impact ministries, where they will learn how to advocate for initiatives within their communities and where their churches are located. And I was grateful that Stephanie um, sent out the information that I could jump on and I tried to send it out for others so they too can be refreshed with what advocacy is. Well, thank you all. Um, it sounds like there's a wealth of experience in this Zoom room together. So um, I hope that as we go through this, you'll you'll feel welcome to jump in. If you think I've missed something, like, you know, based on your own experience with advocacy, if you wanna add something to what I'm saying, feel free to jump in. Um, and I will go ahead and get started. I'm gonna attempt to share my screen. Uh, and despite being this long doing virtual things, I'm not always positive if it'll work the first time I try. So can everyone see the PowerPoint? Yes, okay. Great. Yay, wonderful, okay. Um, and it looks like when I'm in this mode, I'm gonna have a little trouble monitoring the chat. Um, and so Ilona and Tosin, if I could bother you to 
keep an eye on that for me. I would I would appreciate it. Feel free to interrupt me um, if, if you see something interesting in there. So um, I just want to start with some general ways to, to get started. And some of you have already done some of these things. Um, some of you already are already organizing your own advocacy days um, and have submitted testimony. Um, if you're a complete beginner or if you see something here that can kind of add to what you're already doing, um, the very first thing I'd plug is joining the, the advocacy committee with Maryland Public Health Association. Um, it's a really great way to see what's going on at the state level, hear from other advocates and just support each other as we're learning um, ways that we can get involved. Um, and right now is a really good time. If there are organizations that are working on issues that you care about, at the state level in Maryland, get on their email lists now, um, follow their social media accounts. They will tell you what kind of help and support that they need. Um, they'll send email blasts when they need something. Um, they'll ask for volunteers. You can even reach out directly and say you're very interested in what they're doing and to please keep you in the loop in case they have a special email list for people who are you know, extra excited about what they're doing. Um, that's a really good way to make sure that you know what's going on on the issue that you care about. Um, the next thing is know who your legislators are. Uh, if you are a Maryland resident, um, you know, make sure you know who your, your legislators are. You'll have a senator and one or more delegates at the state level, and their job is to listen to you. Um, and then I'm going to walk through this later in the presentation, but familiarize yourself with the Maryland General Assembly website. That's where there's going to be so much information uh, starting in January about all of the state level legislation. Um, you can see recordings of hearings, you can see schedules of hearings, you can see um, information about the key committees, um, how people voted. It's just a really, really good go-to source for information. And of course, read your local papers. Um, I know that a lot of folks don't read newspapers anymore. I don't read a physical newspaper, um, but I do keep on top of state publications like uh, the Baltimore Sun, the Baltimore Banner, Maryland Matters, um, the, the local section of the Washington Post, um, the Maryland Reporter, the Daily Record. Um, and I, I also keep an eye on the opinion sections of those because a lot of times you'll see things bubbling up that are, are being talked about during the session in, in those sections. So um, with that, I'm going to talk today about uh, two things. One is the six steps for effective advocacy is how my organization, Maryland Healthcare for All, um, uses public will and turns it into political power in a way where a lot of times there's a really good public health idea. Um, it's got experts behind it, it's got the public behind it, but it faces really well financed opposition. Um, and an example is making prescription drugs more affordable. There are solutions that most people agree on, and yet um, because of the, the resources that the pharmaceutical industry has, um, it can be really hard to actually make those ideas a reality. And so um, the six steps for effective advocacy is a useful way for organizations to think about how to overcome opposition like that in order to get good policy passed. Along the way of those six steps, I wanna talk about specific ways that individuals can get involved. Um, and so uh, a little bit about Maryland Healthcare for All. Um, our mission is access to quality, affordable healthcare for all Marylanders. Our Healthcare for All Coalition is made up of hundreds of organizations across the state, um, labor, business, community, healthcare, faith groups. Um, and Maryland Public Health Association has been a key partner uh, for, for the policies that we've been able to advocate to enact in Maryland. Um, some big uh, recent wins were passing the Health Equity Resource Act in partnership with Maryland Public Health Association, which invests $59 million over five years into uh, improving health outcomes and reducing health disparities in underserved communities in Maryland. Um, we also passed the first in the nation prescription drug affordability board back in 2019. Uh, and that board is working on uh, setting upper payment limits for state and local governments for high cost drugs. Um, and there's been there's been a lot more, but uh, I don't want to talk too long about that because I, I do want to launch right into advocacy. So let me see if I can get this video going.
While grassroots campaigns need to be strategic, they definitely don't need to reinvent the wheel. There's a proven path for success already being used to transform public will into political power across the nation, and it's explained in the book, The DeMarco Factor. It's a multi-year process, but we can summarize the main points in under two minutes. Step one, create an evidence-based policy plan. This is where you work with local experts and grassroots organizations to develop a watertight, proven policy solution. Don't skip this step. This research sets you up for success throughout your campaign. Next, test the plan with a high-quality poll. If you're going to get groups and politicians to sign on to something, you'd better make sure it moves voters first. And don't skimp on polling. Reliable results from a respected firm get you the credibility you need. Now you're ready to build a coalition. Create a resolution for groups to endorse and work hard to get lots of important organizations signed on. Got your coalition? It's time to bring on the media. The more media, the better, because media coverage builds public support for your cause and motivates your supporters. The fifth step is to make your policy into an election issue. This is when you leverage your coalition's strength to make candidates for office endorse your resolution. Then, let the voters know which candidates have endorsed it and which have not. And lastly, go win in the legislature. Because your powerful coalition got the candidates for office to endorse your cause, you begin the next legislative session with the support of a strong number of legislators committed to get the job done. You've built a powerful grassroots movement and are in a prime position for your policy solution to pass. Ready to learn more? Visit healthcareforall.com slash six steps. So these six steps we've been able to use successfully in Maryland to do a number of things. Um, even before the Affordable Care Act, uh, oh, I see a hand raised. Uh, Genevieve, did you have something you wanted to say? Yes, and I'm, I'm sorry. Well, if I don't want to interrupt as you, I don't want to break up the flow, but if it's okay, if I can ask a quick question, yeah. Sure. So I'm wondering, the steps that are laid out, they seem like they will require some money, like substantial amounts of money. Um, as you go through the steps, can you maybe shed some light into that? Like yeah. bringing on the media, building the coalition, bringing people together. It sounds like it sounds like money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good point. So um, I think that when we're talking about these kinds of issues where you're trying to, to um, overcome deep, well-financed opposition, you are going to need some money. It's not going to be nearly as much money as the opposition has, um, but you need some. So we are an organization of um, four full-time staff members and one part-time staff member. Uh, and this work, if you did the full six steps, um, it could take a couple of years before you get to step six um, because of the, you know, the time it takes in order to get through all of them. Um, our organization is funded primarily through foundations. Uh, and so um, we actually have two organizations. We have a 501c3 and a 501c4, and those are tax designations for types of organizations. Um, and not to get too deep into the weeds, but a 501c3 is an organization that can do public education kind of work. A 501c4 has much more liberty to do lobbying work than a 501c3. So we have two sister organizations, one that focuses on the public education um, and one that focuses on the lobbying. Um, and steps, uh, I'd say one through four, really can be done with a 501c3. And it is easier to raise funds for a 501c3 than it is for a 501c4. Um, and so, uh, yes, from an organizational standpoint, I'd say to really take on an opponent like big tobacco, like big alcohol, like big pharma, you're going to need some resources yourself. Um, and we've used the six steps to, even before the Affordable Care Act uh, went into place, we were able to raise the tobacco tax in Maryland and use the funding from that in order to expand Medicaid in Maryland. Um, and that saved tens of thousands of lives just from raising the tobacco tax by itself without even the healthcare expansion. Just raising the tax saved tens of thousands of lives um, from people who didn't die you know, horrible tobacco-related deaths. Um, and then you add to that that we were able to expand Medicaid. Um, we also were able to increase the alcohol tax and then use the funds from that in order to um, 
help with healthcare programs. And at the same time, we reduce uh, things like binge drinking, um, reduced drunk driving, reduced uh, STI transmission. Um, and then most recently, and I'm going to walk through this in the slides, we were able to create the first in the nation prescription drug affordability board, despite heavy opposition from the pharmaceutical industry. Um, does that kind of address question, Genevieve? Or, okay, um, I'll keep going, but definitely chime up again if, if you have more questions about it. Um, so step one, create an evidence-based plan. Um, so we work a lot with, we're lucky in Maryland, we've got really great uh, public health programs, really great public health schools here and good relationships with researchers at those schools. And so, um, you know, there's a problem. The cost of prescription drugs is too high. I mean, we all know people who are struggling with the rising cost of prescription drugs. Um, it's really, amazing that, you know, one in four people in our country say that they have trouble affording their prescription drugs. Um, and then even if you personally are not experiencing that, um, everyone is affected that by this because uh, as prescription drug costs go up, that affects health insurance costs. Uh, and so anyone who's paying a health insurance premium, uh, a lot of your health insurance premium is going to these skyrocketing drug costs. Uh, and in addition, public health departments are having trouble being able to afford the drugs that they need. So we have a problem. And, um, you know, we know that pharmaceutical corporations spend much more on advertising than they do on research and innovation. And we know that in the United States, we pay more for our medications um, than other similar countries in the world. Um, and so a solution that we worked with researchers to come up with is the Prescription Drug Affordability Board, uh, which would be an independent body with the ability to set upper payment limits on what Marylanders would pay for a high cost drug. Um, similar to how states, you know, handle utilities and insurance premiums. You know, other, other kinds of um, healthcare costs have a, a kind of check in the system, like the Maryland Insurance Administration um, for health insurance premiums or um, the Health Services Cost Review Commission for hospital costs. But no such thing like that existed for pharmaceutical drugs before. So we came up with this idea. Um, and the next step is to commission polling. And so you want to show that the public not only supports your proposal, but that it would actually change people's votes. And I know that this looks a little bit small, but when we did polling in Maryland on would you support the Prescription Drug Affordability Board creation, um, we found that 83% of Marylanders favored it, which was really big. But then even more so, that, more important than that, we saw that if you had uh, like a hypothetical situation where a Democrat candidate for office supported the board and a Republican opposed, then the Democrat would win. If a hypothetical Republican supported it and a Democrat opposed, then the Republican would win. People actually said that they would swing their vote to the other candidate um, and sometimes across party lines. Uh, in order to um, vote on this specific issue, prescription drug affordability. And that's really powerful, um, especially now that someone would cross party lines in order to vote on a specific issue like that. So if you can show something like that, um, that's really powerful. And this is a point where if, if we had seen, you know, the public is not behind us on this issue, um, you know, it would be, very, it's already very hard to overcome financed opposition um, with the public behind you. Without the public behind you, I'm not going to say nothing, you know, it, but things are impossible, but it, it pro it's probably not a very realistic and viable solution yet. And so if that had been the case, um, then we might have to spend more time doing public education um, in order to try to, you know, move the, the needle on public opinion on this. But we did find that they were in strong support. And so uh, along with the polling, we held focus groups in order to fine tune our messaging. And 
you know, one thing we found is we actually originally called this idea the drug cost commission. Uh, and it turned out that people didn't like that wording. They liked prescription drug affordability board. Exact same idea, but people, you know, the idea of the prescription drug affordability board resonated with people better. So we started calling it that. Um, we also found that uh, messaging around how uh, the pharmaceutical corporations spend almost twice as much on advertising than on research and development um, just really made people upset to know that. Um, and they felt that that was a really strong argument for why we needed the Prescription Drug Affordability Board. And so that's helpful messaging for us as we uh, move into the next steps. Um, and so step three is building a coalition. And this can take a lot of time. Um, we, our organization has been around for, now it's been over 20 years. And so it doesn't take us quite as long to build a broad coalition as it used to. You know, when we were starting from scratch, each organization you approach is a new connection and it takes time um, to build trust. Um, and now that we've been doing this for a long time, we can build a coalition much more quickly if we have to. For example, um, when we advocated for the Health Equity Resource Act, we had a few months basically to build a coalition for that. Um, but because you know, we have been building these relationships for, in some cases, decades at this point. Um, it's a lot faster to build a coalition for us now, but, you know, it can take time. Um, and one thing that we really recommend doing when you build a coalition is uh, make it make a one page resolution that organizations can sign on to that explains the problem and explains the solution. Um, it should not be longer than a page. If it's more than a page, start over um, and you know cut it down, make sure that it is only one page. And the reason is that people are busy. A lot of the folks uh, at organizations that you'll want to approach are going to be busy um, and it needs to be something concise. It also helps you with your messaging because you're going to need to concisely uh, convey what you are trying to do over and over and over again uh, as you go through the advocacy. And so having a one page resolution, very helpful. Um, and approach a diverse coalition. Make sure that you're including as many types of organizations as possible. Um, faith communities, very important. Um, you know, already have a moral imperative in many cases to be working on trying to improve access to good health care for people. Um, and then that goes for other good public health policies as well. Um, and then, you know, community groups, labor groups, business groups. Um, you, you have strength in, in numbers, you also have strength in diversity because you want as many different voices coming to the table on this issue as you can, as you can bring. Um, I'll say that I would also encourage for this approach that you are very specific in your resolution about what policy you are trying to enact. Uh, and the reason for that is that um, for some, uh, for a specific policy, if you have both the problem and the solution outlined, we want a prescription drug affordability board, um, it's going to be easier for um, organizations to sign on to that you might have disagreements with in other arenas, uh, you know? Uh, and so if you can be really specific there, then you can convene this coalition for this specific issue. Um, and if you need to disagree with an organization on another issue, that's okay because you've got them on this issue. If it's a coalition that's more like, here is a problem, and we just all agree we need to solve this problem, then when it comes to a point where you might have different opinions on how to solve that problem, um, then things can get a bit sticky. Uh, and so having, having an issue-based resolution, uh, I think is a really strong way to go about this. Um, and just speaking you know, from, our organization's perspective, one way to get involved is if we have a resolution, um, you know, people have connections to groups in their communities uh, that, you know, we as a staff might not. And so a lot of times when we have student interns, we'll ask them, you know, can you bring this to your student groups? Um, are there any, you know, businesses you patronize that might be interested in this? 
Um, and a lot of times uh, students will bring their own connections and help us to build a coalition uh, in that way. Um, and here, here's an example of a student, a previous student who uh, gave a presentation to the Maryland Legislative Coalition uh, and, and helped gain their support for um, this prescription drug affordability work that we were doing. As you're building your coalition, uh, it's really helpful to be, you know, just talking to people, learning about why they're interested in the issue. Um, and you'll run into folks who have really compelling stories about why they care about the issue, how this issue affects them. Um, you know, we ran into uh, Mr. Larry Zarzecki at, I believe, a Maryland nonprofits event. Um, and he told us about how he has Parkinson's disease and has basically, you know, run through his entire retirement account um, because his drugs were just so expensive and how he would have to go without them. Um, and he has been just a key advocate both at the state and now the federal level by sharing that story. Um, Larry's story helped pass the Inflation Reduction Act, which uh, in 2025 is going to have a $2,000 yearly annual cap on out-of-pocket costs for uh, Medicare-covered prescriptions. And so that's gonna make a huge difference to many people across the country, and it's gonna make a difference personally to Larry. So um, as you're building that coalition, um, you know, listen to, to what people are telling you about how this issue affects them and help them um, share those stories with, with legislators, with the public, um, with anyone who it could move in order to move the, the issue forward. Um, step four, utilize the media. Um, we have three types of media that we think about. Um, one of them is paid media. We actually still do radio ads. Um, they are cheaper than television ads. Uh, and you can get not only the ears of people on the radio, but you can also get media attention uh, when you do a radio ad. Um, but we also do digital ads and social media ads as well. Um, and so anything you pay for, radio ads, social media ads, that's paid media. Earned media is when uh, the reporters then cover your issue. And so um, sometimes reporters will write just about the radio ad that you do. Having press conferences about your issue um, can generate a lot of attention. And so when you hold a press conference, you want to invite uh, folks from your coalition who can give a, a unique perspective on, on what the issue means to them. And so, you know, you might have um, a clinician who talks about how high drug costs hurt, hurt their patients. You can have a patient there to talk specifically about their own story and experience with high drug costs. Um, a faith leader and um, Dr. Connor with us today uh, has uh, participate in many a press conference, bringing the faith perspective to, to why this is such an important issue. Um, you also want to be submitting letters to the editor and op-eds to your local papers, and that's something that anybody can do. I mean, anyone can write a letter to their local paper about an important issue, um, and we've had students um, definitely, you know, get pub their letters published about things that are important to them. Um, and then finally, social media. Um, or owned media, owned media is stuff like your website, like your social media channels. Um, and sometimes those those different types of media can feed into each other. Like if if a reporter sees something on your social media and and picks up a story that way, gives you a call. Um, you know, anything you can do to get earned media is helpful. So um, I'm having a little bit of a glitch on my computer, but I think this will still work. So here's a recent um, digital ad that we've been running about this issue. Peace, I'm Baltimore Mayor Brandon Scott. I'm Prince George's County Executive Angela Also Brooks. I'm Anne Arundel County Executive Stuart Pittman. I'm County Executive Mark Elrich. My name is Ruben Collins. I'm President of the Charles County Board of Commissioners. Baltimore County Executive Johnny Olszewski. I'm your Howard County Executive, Calvin Ball. Across Maryland, too many residents are forced to choose between their medication and other necessities like rent and groceries. Drug costs are too high. 
and many Marylanders struggle to pay for the medications they need to stay healthy. We need continued action on this pressing issue. That's why I support state legislation to bring down prescription drug costs for everyone. I urge the General Assembly to make it happen in 2024. Together, we can lower drug costs for all of us. And this is an op-ed that um, a resident wrote. It was back in 2018, but I come back to it because it was so powerful and I really do think help move the issue forward and help us pass this legislation in 2019. Um, she had had a patient very sadly pass away uh, and it was because she couldn't afford the medication that she needed for, for her heart. Um, and that was an extremely powerful story for her to share. Um, and I think that uh, you know, as, as public health professionals and as public health students, um, you know, connections with patients who are living through these issues um, and experiencing the consequences um, can mean that our voices can be very powerful. Their voice, the patient's voices can be very powerful. And anything that you can do to uplift those voices um, is important. Now, I think it's it's also very important that you are sensitive to when people are going through um, a bad experience. You never wanna just take someone's story and run with it without making sure that you have their permission. Um, as much as possible, you wanna give people the opportunity to share their stories themselves in whatever form that they feel comfortable with, whether that's writing a letter, um, whether that's calling their own legislator, whether that's giving testimony. Um, it's very important, you know, not to, even if it's for um, a hopefully good consequence of passing good legislation, um, equally as important is to, to make sure that you are um, being sensitive to the, the pain that people are going through and, and making sure that you're not adding to it by using their story in, in, a, in a manipulative kind of a way. So, um, so, I think we're in a unique position to to know these stories, um, and also it's it's very important to make sure that you're protecting people's dignity and protecting their feelings as you're you're helping them to advocate. So something that you can do, something that patients can do, write to your local paper. When you write a letter to the editor, it should be 175 to 300 words. Um, and you want to clearly state your position, uh, describe how the public health research supports your position. Um, and it can be about a bill that's coming up in the legislature that you support. It can be one that you oppose and think is a bad idea. Um, it could be not about a bill at all. It could be about uh, a law that already passed, an opportunity that exists because of a law that already passed. Um, for example, um, right now is open enrollment for Marylanders who don't have coverage through another way you can get health coverage through Maryland Health Connection. Um, because of a policy that we advocated for in collaboration with Maryland Public Health Association, um, there are special state subsidies for young adults to be able to better afford these health coverage plans through Maryland Health Connection. And so um, when that first launched a few years ago, a student wrote to their paper and just highlighted this opportunity, encouraged young adults especially to go apply for health coverage if they didn't have it already. Um, and so just as important as advocating for something during a legislative session, once you have a win, uh, it's important to make sure that people know about the new opportunities available to them. Um, and, and so that's an equally you know, great way uh, to get involved and, and to um, a reason to write a letter. Um, using social media. so. Um, you know, this is free. Anyone can do this. If you have a social media account, uh, highlight the stories of patients and the posts of organizations whose work you support. Um, and as you are getting involved with, with advocacy work, if you go to an advocacy day, you know, take pictures while you're there um, and then post it. It's going to help bring uh, the public eye to an issue where if they weren't there in person, they can still see it. Um, through you, uh, and you can post them yourself and tag the organization. You can send them directly to the organization working on the issue. If you don't have social media, um, you know, just just ways to highlight what's going on. Um, 
in addition to what to reading local papers, another and and subscribing to emails of organizations and following on them on social media. There's also every year on um, X, formerly Twitter, uh, there's a bunch of chatter during the session. And actually, this is the time that I find X the most helpful of the entire year is during the session. Um, Unfortunately, there's not one single hashtag for the legislative session. Somehow it feels like there's always at least four. It's some variation of MGA or MDGA and the year. And so um, I would follow all of, you know, MDGA 24, MGA 24, et cetera. Um, and if you keep an eye on that, you'll be able to see a lot of what's going on. Uh, and then at key moments during an advocacy campaign, organizations will tell you, this is the time you need to contact your legislator, or this is a specific legislator that we need help reaching. Um, and so, you know, you can contact your own legislators. If you don't live in the district of a legislator that needs to be contacted right then, maybe you know somebody who lives there. Um, and one of the reasons that that can really matter is that, uh, depending on when the hearing is and which legislators are on the committee that the hearing is being held in, um, that, that'll inform, you know, who needs to be contacting the legislators and where. So I have Stephanie. Stephanie um, yep. Oh, I'm sorry. There's a question. <laughs> oh, do you want to, <laughs> there's a question from Genevieve. Um, it, it reads, I sometimes hear the terms advocacy and lobbying used interchangeably. Can you speak to the differences between the two? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. So um, legally lobbying is when you're being, you're, if you're getting paid um, and gosh, this is a whole legal question and I am not a legal expert. So, um, but just broadly, if you're not being paid, then I don't think you have to worry that you personally are lobbying. Um, if you are just a concerned citizen advocating about something, um, you don't have to worry about being called a, a lobbyist. You're not legally a lobbyist. Um, if you are being paid over a certain threshold to advocate in specific ways, um, so that's not, this is not all inclusive, but some of the ways could be talking to legislators, encouraging people to contact their legislators. Um, writing letters to the editor specifically about a particular bill, not just an idea, not, you know, say before the legislative session, there's a policy idea, but there's no bill after the session starts, there's a particular bill and you're writing about that particular bill, like that could be lobbying. Um, and there, there are more things than that that could be considered lobbying. So if you are being paid uh, to do that kind of advocacy, then you may need to register as a lobbyist in Maryland. And then there, there's um, some ethics training that you need to go through. Um, and there, there are a few other requirements of you reporting the hours that you spent lobbying each month, um, that kind of a thing. So uh, that's kind of a little bit of the legal differentiation there. Does, does that make sense? Okay, great. Thanks for that question. Um, all right, I'm gonna speed through steps five and six a bit and then go a little bit more into specific tangible things you can do during the session. So step five is to make your issue an election issue. If you can do this, it can make a big impact. So during an election year, you know, legis potential legislators, like current legislators who are running again, um, all of the candidates are gonna have, you're, they're gonna wanna listen to you um, because it's an election year. and so. One thing you can do is uh, just the same way that you made a resolution that organizations can sign on to, you can make a resolution for candidates to sign on to. Um, this is definitely a lobbying activity. So this is something that you would want your 501c4, which has much more um, lobbying freedom to, to, to take on. Uh, and so you make that one page resolution, you send it to every candidate for the legislature running in Maryland, um, and you say, we really urge you to sign on to this. Um, after a specific date, we will publish the list of who signed on or who didn't. Um, we as an organization, we don't endorse particular candidates. Um, we are nonpartisan. 
Um, we're not saying vote for this person. Um, we're not even saying we endorse them, but we're just saying here is a list of those who signed on or those who didn't. Um, and the public can you know, use that information however they would like. Um, and so we did that. And not only did we make that resolution, but for those who did sign on, we made them a little social media toolkit that they could use to put on their email newsletters. Um, they could put on their mailers and, and um, their social media and just to show that they signed on to this, they care about prescription drug affordability, that actually um, candidates for office doing that was noticed in social media by a reporter at Stat News. And so um, Stat News actually wrote about that only because legislators were posting this on social media. So that was a, a kind of cool way to show how um, something free, social media, um, could generate much more attention than, than just the, the smaller reach alone of, of posting it. Um, and Senator Kathy Klausmeyer, um, you know, specifically was a lead sponsor for prescription drug affordability board legislation. And the fact that she was really in support of, of that, I think helped her probably win her race. Um, so it can, it can make a, a big difference to the candidates and also to your power as an organization if, if you make it an election issue. And then step six, go to the legislature. Um, in 2019, we ultimately uh, were able to pass prescription drug affordability board legislation. Um, it was not the full, uh, it was not a board with the full amount of power that we had wanted. We wanted that within five years, the board would, would be able to set up our payment limits for high cost drugs for all Marylanders. Um, and what we got was that they could do it for state and local governments, which was a win. I mean, it was a big win. Um, you know, the nobody else in the whole country had created a board. Uh, and we knew that we would be coming back in order to fight for them to have their authority expanded um, to be able to do it for all Marylanders beyond state and local governments. Uh, but it, it was very exciting and um, and some keys to a successful session, find a great lead sponsor. Um, Delegate Pena Melnick, now chair of the Health and Government Operations Committee, um, has been a lead sponsor for us on this and, and other bills and is just a fabulous leader, um, just an amazing public health advocate. Um, and we were very lucky that she was our lead sponsor. Um, you wanna mobilize your coalition, so getting them involved, you don't stop engaging the media during the session, even though it's step four, you know, you keep going, you engage the media, um, you mobilize your coalition to be uh, submitting testimony, you mobilize them to ask their members to contact legislators at key times. Um, during your hearings, you want to elevate both experts, and then just folks, regular folks with, with stories about how the issue affects them. So we've got a legislative session coming up. Um, this year it runs from January 10th to April 8th. Uh, and there are a few other key dates that are important. Um, one is that by early February, February 5th in the House, February 9th, sorry, February 5th in the Senate, February 9th in the House, um, that's when the bills have to be introduced. So if you don't have a bill yet, uh, about a month into the session, um, you're, you're not gonna have a bill. So that's, that's a first key deadline. A second key deadline is March 18th. So um, in order for a bill to become a law here, it has to get through a committee, and then it has to be voted on by a chamber, and then it has to cross to the other house and um, be voted out of committee and then be voted out of that chamber. So, okay, if a bill starts in, for example, the House Health and Government Operations Committee, um, it has to have had a hearing um, in, in Maryland. Uh, they, they actually try to give all the bills hearings. Not every state does that, but um, for most bills in Maryland, if, if a bill exists, it gets a hearing. So the committee has a hearing, the committee votes on it, um, and then it goes to the full chamber. So if it started in the House Health and Government Operations Committee, it then will go to the House chamber um, and the House, the full House votes on it. Um, and 
Uh, if the House full chamber passes it, then it will go to a Senate committee. Um, so say it then goes to a Senate Finance Committee and they pass it out, it'll go to the full Senate and they pass it out um, and say that somehow along the way, you know, it's been, it had no amendments. And so the, the bills that have passed in both the House and the Senate are identical. Um, then the bills pass and the next step is it'll go over to the governor for signing. Um, often along the way, there might be amendments that happen. And so say that the, a version passes out of the House, it goes to the Senate, the Senate makes amendments. Um, and what passes out of the Senate is different versions than what passed out of the House. Then um, the House and the Senate will have to reconcile those differences. Uh, and then um, if they're not reconciled in time or you know a reconciled version can't gain, a, gain enough support for both chambers to support it, then the bill dies. Um, do bills do bills that um, have the same topic? Can they be introduced at the same time in the Senate as well as in the House? Yes, that's a good question. So often a bill will be cross-filed. So the same bill uh, might be introduced in a House committee and a Senate committee at the same time. Um, they'll have two different bill numbers, but they'll be identified as cross-filed bills. Um, and so they can both be going through that process at the same time. Um, and so by March 18th, crossover day, a bill must have made it out of at least one of the chambers. Um, if it does not make it out of at least one chamber by then, it almost certainly is dead. There are very limited exceptions to that. Um, some bills could go through what's called the Rules Committee. If, if the leadership of the Senate or the House really prioritize it, then there are exceptions that can be made. But almost always, if a bill has not passed out of a chamber by March 18th, it's dead. So that's a very important date um, for advocates to know about. Um, bill hearings are typically Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays from about 1 p.m. until whenever the hearing ends. Um, and those dates will be posted uh, on the website ahead of time. Uh, signing up to testify is something that anybody can do. Um, however, it is a little tricky. Um, so, and the Senate and the House have slightly different policies related to signing up to testify. Uh, and so that can make it even trickier. Um, and we'll go a little bit through the website, but basically there's two types of testimony you can do. You can do written testimony, you can do oral testimony. You can choose to just do one or the other, you can choose to do both. Um, written testimony, uh, I'll, I'll show you an example of what that can look like. Um, it's a, you know, a document that you prepare that then you upload through the website at a specific time ahead of the hearing uh, and, uh, and then it's done. Once it's uploaded, you're good to go. Um, oral testimony uh, is you can do it either. And I, this might depend on the committee a bit, but at least in the Senate Finance and House Health and Government Operations Committees, it seemed you could do it either in person or virtually. The legislators heavily prefer it to be in person when possible, um, but you can do it either way. And again, you have to sign up for that during a particular window ahead of the hearing. Um, and I don't think that they've posted the guidelines for that for 2024 yet, they still have the 2023 rules up, um, but at least in the Senate last year, I believe it was you have to you have to either to do written or oral testimony. You have to sign up the one business day before between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. In the House, it was two business days before between 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. And you have to use their website. You have to create an account on their website, a MyMGA account, and you, you have to sign up through their portal during those specific time frame. Um, and so- Steph Yeah, Stephanie, can you please let us know when you see that schedule? 
Yeah. For 2024? Okay. Yeah, that would be good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I will. Um, they've got the key dates like I've listed here, but they don't, I haven't seen the clarification if it's the one day or two business days this time to this time um, for signing up for the hearings. I think it will probably be the same, but I don't know for sure. Um, and so you can see how that could get a little confusing. Like if you have a hearing on a Monday, when do you sign up? You might have to sign up Thursday or Friday um, between 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. through this website. Uh, and you could not, you could, you had to pick if you were doing oral testimony, whether you're doing it in person or virtual at the time you sign up and you cannot change it. Um, also, you cannot sign up for yourself and then say, oh, I can't actually make it. I'm gonna send someone else in my place. They won't allow that. Whoever signs up is the person who has to go. Um, so but this only happens after the February 5th and February 9th, right? Um, here you could start before are... that point. The, the February 5th and February 9th is the latest that a bill must be introduced. But uh -huh. there will be bills that, for example, were already pre-filed even before the session were pre-filed. And so some bills might start having hearings pretty quickly once the session okay. starts. Mm -hmm. um, even after March 18th, you might still be having hearings because the bill might have passed one chamber but still need to have a hearing you know, in, in the corresponding committee in the opposite chamber. Um, so those are, those are a few guidelines about the hearings. And then floor sessions, which is when the full chambers convene, um, those are typically Monday evening and then mornings on Tuesday through Friday. Um, so if you were in Annapolis, the hearings, the committee hearings are, there's there's three buildings. There's the state house, there's the house office building, and there's the Senate office building. The committee hearings are generally in the office building. So, I mean, they're always in the office building. So if you had a Senate committee hearing you had to attend to, you'd go to the Senate building, find the right committee, same for the House, House hearing, go to the House office building. Then when the, the full chambers convene, that's going to be in the State House. Um, and there's a Senate side and there's a House side. And typically they meet at about the same time. Um, and the bill hearing schedule can always be thrown off because if a floor session goes much longer than anticipated, say there's a really contentious bill and there's a lot of floor debate that day, even though a bill hearing might be scheduled for one, it could be pushed back to two or three. Um, and you don't know how long a hearing will go either because they'll have a list of bills that they're going to go through during the hearing. Um, and who knows how long that'll take. Um, it depends on how many people have signed up to testify and it depends on how many questions the legislators have uh, for the panels that, that have signed up to testify. Do, do they have a limit on the numbers that can testify? So First come, first serve? Um, so different committees do it different ways. Some have limits. Um, and the limit is not first come, first serve. It's uh, by lottery system. Um, oh. So for those committees, I think the way that it generally works is the lead sponsor of the bill can have a few people that they say, I definitely want these people to testify. And then the rest of the slots are by lottery. So anyone who signs up within that time frame, they'll get an email later to tell them whether they were chosen in the lottery or not. Um, other committees, it's unlimited. As many people can sign up as want to. Um, and then I think, I, I'm not an expert on all the committees, but at least in the finance and the house committee, uh, the, the HGO committee, um, they have two minute limits. So the lead sponsor gets longer than that. I forget if it's, it's five minutes maybe. Um, and then each other witness gets two minutes in total. Um, That's unless, correct, yeah. And then if a legislator has specific questions for a witness, then you know you can talk longer to answer that question. But your, your initial testimony is just up to two minutes. And they'll have a timer there. Um, and so let me see what this next slide has. Okay, so that's just the website. Let me talk a little bit more about- By the way, if I can uh, add, uh, when I testified, I read from my testimony so I could keep in the time and the chair said, 
don't read, just tell me what's going on, you know? So it's just a hint so that you can just say it rather than try to read it and keep in the time. Right. Yeah, it's a good point. Um, so yeah, I have definitely heard legislators say, don't just read what you've submitted in the written testimony. Like we already have it in written. We don't want to hear you just say it out loud. Right. Um, that said, it can be, um, it can, you know, I think it's maybe if not intentionally uh, into an intimidating atmosphere, the end result is that it can be an intimidating atmosphere to be giving oral testimony. Um, mm -hmm. You're in a very ornate room um, with all the legislators in front of you. Um, and they've been watching hearings, you know, all day. And so we're all human. Sometimes some people's attention might wander a little bit. Um, and you have your two minutes and you're trying to make an impact um, and you and uh, you're trying to get everything that you want to say into that two minutes. Um, ideally, you'd speak from the heart like that is the most ideal thing that in the way it would work. You'd introduce yourself. If you're representing an organization, you say the organization. If you're not, you know, you just maybe say something about your background um, and you say clearly whether you support it whether you support it with an amendment or whether you oppose it. Uh, and then you go into why, um, and then you end again repeating um, your position. And uh, if you can keep all of that in your head and speak from the heart, I think that probably has one of the best ways to kind of cut through um, the legislators having to listen to person after person after person for hours, you know, reading out loud. That said, not everyone can do that. And even if you can do that, that particular day, you might just not be feeling it. Um, and so another way you could go about it is have your written testimony, but then have a script for your oral testimony that is different from your written testimony. And that way, if you need to lean on it and, and read something out loud and know that it's within the two minute time frame, at least you know the legislators know you're not just reading aloud what they already have in front of them. You're bringing something new to the table, and so I think that's that's a, a reasonable way to get around that. Um, if you have a personal story, I think that's also a good thing to share there. Again, making sure that if there are other people in your story, that it's okay with them that you're doing this. Um, but person personal stories about how an issue impacts you uh, can have can have a big impact because legislators also listen to um, lobbyists all day. Uh, and so having real people who see the effects of something uh, of a policy or a policy that doesn't exist yet, but should, that can also cut through the chatter and, and help them hear what you're trying to say. Um, if anyone else has any uh, advice about your experiences with providing oral testimony. Um, this would, you know, I, I'd welcome you to jump in right now and say what it was like for you and if you have any tips based on your experience. Okay, um, well, I know we're coming up on time. So um, if you go to the Maryland General Assembly website, they actually have videos to help you navigate through that website um, that, that can be useful. I, I highly encourage folks to go on and just kind of poke around, make a MyMGA account, just kind of familiarize yourself with how it works. Welcome to the Maryland General Assembly. Sorry. Um, in the upper right corner, you'll see a search menu. Um, and right now there's no legislation up for 2024 yet. But if you go to the search menu and then click on the 2023 session, you can kind of poke around and see bills from last year and what the web page looks like. You can see the titles, the sponsors, the policy and fiscal notes, um, this little video camera um, next to the committees, the little video cameras, you can actually watch hearings from the past. Um, and that'll kind of just give you a sense of how hearings go. Um, you can see witness list. The witness list is the written testimony that was submitted. So if there's an issue last year that you cared about, the bill didn't pass, you can go back and look and kind of get a historical record. What did were people saying about it back then? Um, and that'll give you a little more context for what's going to be happening this year. 
And you can see like this bill was cross-filed with another bill. Um, so if you click that, you'll see the same information, um, but for the House. Um, if you're part of the advocacy committee, we'll help you with written testimony. We'll help you prepare for oral testimony. Um, contacting your legislators is always helpful. Join an advocacy day. Um, as you learn how to do all this stuff, teach other people how to do it. Um, help them walk through them because the more people know how the system works, the more empowered we'll all be. And this is an example of written testimony from MDPHA. As you can see, it's two paragraphs. One of the paragraphs is two sentences. It does not have to be long. Um, you can make a big impact just by writing a couple paragraphs that is well-researched um, and submitting it. So, you know, if you're thinking I'm intimidated by this, it doesn't have to take a lot of time. It could take a little bit of time. You upload it, you're done. You've done a great bit of advocacy just by writing it and knowing when and how to upload it at the correct time. Um, these are examples of our great interns and students who have submitted oral testimony. Many of them, it was the first time they did it. They all knocked it out of the park. They did a great job. Um, and I just admire their tenacity so much for, for going for it. Um, an example, email to, the, to legislators, quick to the point, two or three paragraphs, even one paragraph can get your point across. Um, and then after you win, remember to say thank you. Legislators are people too. Uh, and work on making sure that your new law is implemented well. So thank you all for joining me today. I've got my contact info here. Uh, and, and please reach out. I know I went on and on a little bit. I mean, we ran out of time, but I'm happy to answer follow-up questions uh, and um, let you know how you can get involved in, in anything I'm working on too. So thank you. Wow. Thank you. This this is very informative. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Uh, and thanks to everyone for joining. Um, I know we have a minute for any um, pressing questions or questions before we go to the day. Can we get a copy of the uh, the um, the presentation the slides? We will follow up with an email. Um, as long as you're on the advocacy committee list listserv for MDPHA, I'd be happy to send that out to everybody, including the recording of today's session, as well as all of the slides. Thanks a lot. How do you get on your listserv? <laughs> Just a quick question um, for Stephanie. So how can an individual or a group of people, a community, get Health for All to pick up an important issue that we want to you know, advocate for? Um, because I don't think I have a good sense of how you go from, hey, this is an issue that I'm seeing in my community. I want to work on it. We get some community members together. And then to move the steps, the the uh, six stages that you described seems like it requires working with an advocacy group like Health for All in order to you know go through that process because I can't imagine a group of community folks being able, like I mentioned, to have the money to go through all of those steps. So how does Health for All identify which issues are important to you know to move forward, or uh, how can community folks get their um, concerns heard by an organization like yours? Yeah, it's a good question. I know it's one o'clock, so if anyone needs to drop off, I will not be offended if you drop off at this point. For anyone who wants to stay, um, please stay. You're very welcome. Um, so we have um, community forums uh, frequently about the issues that we're working on. Um, and so um, oftentimes people will bring ideas up then. Um, depending on what we're already working on in our capacity, we may or may not be the right organization to take that issue on. So if, if we are, um, then you know we'll work with you to learn more about the issue and, and figure out how, you know, how we can make an impact there. It might not be a full advocacy campaign. It depends on what the issue is. It might be something um, where you know, if we know the right people, like we know we have good connections with folks at Maryland Health Benefit Exchange, for example, 
there might be something that doesn't require legislative action, but maybe some kind of administrative action. Um, and so we maybe we can try to raise up the issue that way. Um, if it's something that is uh, not in our scope, um, then we might try to refer to a different organization that could be a better fit. Um, so, you know, it, it really depends on what the issue is, um, but whatever it is, we, you know, we do our best to try to make sure that if we can't take it on ourselves, that we can connect folks with the right people who hopefully can. Any other questions or comments? Can you think of any creative assignments for students who want to get engaged in advocacy work? Um, yeah, I mean, well, with my students, I really like to assign things like um, make an elevator pitch. Yeah, you know? I do that. Yeah, um, mm. write a letter to the editor, a draft one. You don't have to submit it, but you can write, write draft testimony. Um, mm. And, you know, that way, Students have a real thing where if they wanted to that session, they could take it and run with it. Or if they just want to use it as practice, that's okay too. But just trying to give um, real tangible um, skills that the folks can take with them. Write a one-page resolution. I that's what I love. Yeah, I love that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that way you get practice building up your case, coming up with a solution, and making it as concise as possible. Mm -hmm. um, Stephanie, I have a question about um, step two of the six steps. So I, think mm -hmm. um, yeah. I know you said testing a high quality poll. How technical does this have to be? Could it be as simple as a, I know, you know, on your um, slide, you showed, um, you know, some voters and, but could this, could it be as simple as a Facebook poll or like how far can one go? Or how simple can it be to be effective? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so for us, the polling is, is important for two reasons. One, to see is the public behind us and will people change their votes? Two, to show to legislators and the media. Um, and so we try to, it does cost some money, but we try to invest in high quality polling. Um, we personally use a company called Opinion Works. Um, they, we've been working with them for a long time. I think they've done a good job as, as Things change, you know, people used to do polling by calling landlines. Um, some people still do that, uh, even in this day and age. I think Opinion Works has done a good job of keeping up with the times and, and making sure that their techniques um, are effective in our modern era. And so um, it's there are pollsters that we trust, but there are also pollsters, I think, that the media and legislators trust. And so if they see something like that, it's going to have a bit more of an impact than if you know, if I did a Facebook poll. Um, so ideally you you invest in, in some high quality polling in, in order to do that. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Stephanie, Luna, or me? Well, I guess I'd just like to end with um, like a cool little story, which is uh, a member of the advocacy committee. Her name is Mukta. Um, she had never submitted written or oral testimony one year, um, but she had been attending the meetings and listening to what issues were being raised up and really wanted to get involved. Um, and together, she and I worked together to so that she could submit both written and oral testimony to um, create the Young Adult Subsidies Program to help young adults afford health coverage. Um, and uh, I believe she was the only young adult who testified about it, um, but she was able to speak from her own personal experience how this kind of a program would have made a really big difference to her um, back when she was a contact tracer for Baltimore County government and she was on a contract and it didn't include health coverage. Um, and she was eligible for Medicaid through an emergency COVID program, but what was going to happen after that? And thankfully she found another position that did offer health coverage, um, but she was you know, concerned. So she made her voice heard, that legislation passed 
Um, and then uh, the Biden administration um, later, a year or two later, was looking for stories from folks who had benefited from the Affordable Care Act. Um, and we passed, as an organization, we packed Mukta's, passed Mukta's name along and um, we didn't know what was going to happen and she didn't know, but they gave her like a Zoom link and President Biden and President Obama both got on the Zoom um, and thanked her, you know, for, for being there and sharing her story. Um, and it was a huge surprise. And so you just, you never know where your advocacy is going to take you. She's helped um, many people in Maryland get access to health coverage um, and even got to speak with some of the most um, powerful policymakers in our nation. So, um, you know, I'm not saying that if you participate with the advocacy committee, you get to meet the president, but it's happened once. So, you know, you never know. <laughs> I think that's a wonderful note to end on. I hope everybody enjoyed that session and learned a lot. I know I did. I know Tosin, we had a little offline chat as well, has learned a lot. So thank you so much, Stephanie, for taking the time. We really appreciate it. Thank you, everybody, for coming and um, taking some time out of your busy schedules to join us here today. And we hope to be able to reconnect with all of you again in the very near future. Again, as I mentioned in the chat, if you're not already on our listserv or if you're not sure if you're on our listserv, please feel free to email me. It's I as in ICE, K as in koala, 421 at georgetown.edu. Again, that is in the chat. Um, so feel free to reach out and we hope to see all of you and hear from all of you in this upcoming legislative session. Thank you again for your time and have a great rest of your day.